all very much for being here with us today. Uh, we are very glad uh, as an Eteron Institute for, social Re for Research and Social Change uh, to have with us today two distinguished personalities on the issues of uh, social inclusion, welfare state, employment. Uh, next to me is Laszlo Antor. Uh, he is the chairman, the secretary of the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, FEPS, as we know it, and he used to be uh, the Commissioner of the European Union on issues of employment and social affairs. And on the right is uh, Azita Berara Wad. Uh, she is currently the chair of the board at the United Nations Research Institute uh, for, for Social Development. And she has a long experience at uh, the ILO. Uh, she used to be the director for a lot of years of the Department of Employment Policy. Uh, so, so it's great to have you here with us to discuss about social inclusion and how to foster it. So if I may start with you, Laszlo. Uh, you have published recently a new book. Uh, it's called the Europe, Europe Social Integration, Welfare Models and Economic Transformations, uh, where you stress issues about the importance of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to ask you, I remember in the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, there used to be a lot of discussion about uh, the welfare state in Europe as an institution and rigidity, as a problem mm. in terms of competitiveness, especially when it was compared with uh, the United States. So in your book, you are you're arguing in favor of the welfare state. What is the reasons? What are the reasons? Indeed. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for mentioning the book. It looks like this. <laughs> and I hope uh, many of you will have the opportunity to read this. The question refers to one of the most important paradigm shifts of the last decade. Why? Because um, the concept of the social investment uh, became so central in the recent period, at least what concerns the policies of the European Union, mm -hmm. uh, highlighting that uh, some of the most successful countries from economic per performance point of view and also export performance are actually high redistribution countries mm -hmm. uh, like Sweden or the Netherlands, which invest a lot in uh, childcare, uh, schooling um, and uh, skills development uh, and uh, uh, through this they also maintain high level of social cohesion mm -hmm. but at the same time uh, great capacity for economic uh, performance uh, as well. So this assumed contradiction which was previously in economic literature but also public policy popping up very frequently mm -hmm. is not really a central uh, piece anymore. Uh, there's a lot more emphasis on the need for investing in social cohesion and social dialogue. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Azit, I'm coming to you now. Uh, as we all know, the overarching uh, title of the conference here, of the, of the Delphi Economic Forum, is Shifting Paradigms. Uh, this is, there's, there has been a lot of discussion globally, actually, about uh, shifting paradigms. Uh, every, every part uh, that takes uh, participates in these uh, debates uh, have their own opinions about how these paradigms uh, can shift. So my question is uh, how do you think that there is a paradigm shift especially in terms of employment and the welfare state and what are the potentials for a real uh, paradigm shift and also what, are the, what should be the characteristics of this paradigm shift? Thank you very much, Gabriel, for uh, first the opportunity to be here with you on this very important discussion, even if we have a very short time at hand to discuss about <laughs> big, big issues. Exactly. Uh, let me build on what just Laszlo mentioned. Uh, let's look what is the paradigm, the current paradigm, and whether there is a shift. We are seeing a shift or not. And let me... Um, kind of enlarge the di discussion from Europe to the global perspective. What we know, and there is a growing consensus in the diagnosis of where we stay and what the globalization policies, the way they have been developing under the, not to call it cliche, but neoliberal policy paradigm, mm -hmm. uh, what ha it hasn't delivered by and large on jobs and on social inclusion. We can go to the detail of variations at the country level, regional level, so, yep. but globally, if we consider just a few indicators, we have had a consistent decline of the share of labor in 
overall income, nationally, globally. And this curve is not contested. All economists agree with that. So the benefits of globalization haven't been distributed as fairly as necessarily <laughs> into uh, back to labor. So the question has been, and that is part of the story of rising inequality, including on the basis of socioeconomic inequality. I take another uh, indicator. I don't work. If we talk about access to jobs, the job gaps for those who are seeking for jobs but not finding, not finding adequate jobs, uh, that is a, a, a big challenge everywhere. If we look at those who have a job, but with low pay, with low wages, with insecure tenure, temporary, voluntary, uh, uh, involuntary, temporary uh, jobs, that has been on the increase. And finally, if we think that 4 billion people, almost half the humanity, has no access to social protection, that gives you a picture of how the current paradigm is not delivering, has not delivered, by and large, on social. Are we seeing a shift in paradigm. I think if we think of paradigm shift in terms of action, uh, in terms of policy practice, may, we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. But if we think about the wake up call that was COVID-19 pandemic, exposing the, um, so the fault lines and also insisting on the fact that Part of the resilience of our societies is the social cohesiveness, social inclusion, and the conditions of work of what we labeled essential workers. So I think that in the diagnosis, in the idea, ideational aspects of, of uh, paradigm change, we are seeing lots of ideas coming into the, the fore for a new paradigm, for a new social contract. Obviously, Europe is ahead of the curve, but also you're seeing this happening in very many different quarters on financing for social policy, on, let me not, on, on the issue of just transition in the environmental transition, in the question of uh, uh, access to universal social protection rather than targeted social protection that make many people falling between the tracks. So there are lots of ideas around that, and there are lots of demands, and how these you know, paradigms shift over, don't shift overnight, mm -hmm. but we really, I think, uh, I'm of the view that the pendulum is swinging. We don't know yet in what direction, but hopefully for a bet better paradigm on social inclusion. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Azita. Uh, Laszlo, you know very well, and from your experience as a commissioner and obviously uh, from your position at FEPS right now, uh, in Europe we have uh, faced a number of crises in the last uh, 15 years. It was the sovereign debt crisis, uh, afterwards we had the pandemic, now we are all facing globally uh, a crisis of living cost with uh, rising inflation, rising interest rates, there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, about what will happen in the global economy. At the same time, uh, even the IMF acknowledges that there is not such a thing as a wage price spiral as it used mm -hmm. to be in the 70s. And uh, there is also, um, people also acknowledge that the, the impact of inflation of, uh, for, for the poorer households as well is asymmetrical to the rest of society. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be, in terms of social inclusion, in terms of the welfare mm -hmm. state, what do you think should be the mechanisms uh, that would protect uh, households uh, from mm -hmm. the loss of purchase, purchasing power? And uh, how we could somehow enhance in the, in the level of the European Union uh, a, a social just uh, framework to deal with this issue? Mm -hmm. uh, this is very interesting because the crises you listed the Eurozone crisis, pandemic, and... Uh, I, could the add, I could add refugees, I could add a lot of things exactly. as well. And and they, uh, they are different in nature, mm -hmm. and they impacted on the economy differently, but also require different answers from the point of view of the social policy, because That's the social right. policy very often comes as a rear guard mm -hmm. to, to, to pick up the consequences, okay. um, not always as an investment approach, um, but, but it, it also gives an opportunity 
to step up uh, the social safety nets in more general terms. And um, in a way, the European Union um, in 2017 introduced the so-called pillar of the social right, which creates a new uh, ideological framing for policy development. And to the pandemic, it already helped to uh, provide a more robust answer and bring forward directives like minimum wage coordination in the European Union, which previously was not possible, mm -hmm. or the pay transparency directive, which helps to close the gender pay gap um, in the EU. Now, the cost of living crisis is again different, right? Because yep. it's a different nature of um, an, an economic crisis. And um, there have been various calls for taxing uh, the extra profits which have been generated by the explosion of energy prices. Even the head of the United Nations, uh, Mr. Guterres, was calling for windfall taxes on energy companies in order to have resources for redistribution and strengthening the social safety nets. This is one direction. In Europe, I think we also need to see if the tax system allows for more opportunities for correction, because there are still almost 10 countries with a flat income tax. I think this is a problem, right? So I think uh, any decent democracy should have a progressive income uh, tax, and countries could be encouraged to move uh, to this uh, direction. Uh, now, then the question is how you strengthen social safety nets. Should it be on the national level or should it be at the European level? In the case of the pandemic, a very important move was implemented at the EU level to create a job protection system based on the German model, which they call the Kurzarbeit, to shorten the working mm. time uh, in order to save more jobs. And then you don't need to rehire people after the recession is over. This was a very good model, but the current crisis is different. Yep. So that's why, in my view, this would be the time to introduce the unemployment benefit scheme, some kind of risk sharing at the level of the European Union, mm -hmm. in order to ensure that the safety net at the national level can be better functioning and more stable, more resilient. I see. Oh, that's great. Uh, but, uh, if, if we had time, I would ask you more questions about uh, this scam. But uh, maybe in the end, uh, if we have time, I can come back to that. As, Azita, you are, uh, I, we have discussed it. Uh, one of your main interests is uh, about uh, youth, about the youth unemployment, which is a global issue as well. But here in Europe, and especially in the southern Europe, uh, it's one of the big problems, structural problems, that we confront. Uh, Spain is ranking first in the statistics, in the European statistics, in terms of uh, youth unemployment. Greece is, has been second. Uh, although, al although the percentage here in Greece has fallen since uh, uh, the previous decade with uh, the crisis, it's still about uh, 28%. Uh, ho however, there is one characteristic that I find it uh, very interesting, that uh, although, although youth unemployment is falling, it's not falling because uh, it's, it's falling because more people uh, exit uh, the, the labor market because the, the participate on, participation rate uh, is raising. And this is something, it's also a global trend. We were talking about the great resignation before a few years after the pandemic. So my question is, how do we deal with this kind of problems uh, as far as it concerns youth employment? Thank you for the question, uh, Gabriel. Youth employment, and I, I, I know that Laszlo has been also focusing a lot on that uh, at the time he was at the European Commission with this innovation on youth guarantees and so on. Youth employment, I qualified youth employment, employment. crisis rather okay. than unemployment crisis mm -hmm. for the reasons that you explained, but also the fact that we noticed, all the analysis showed that in the wake of the 2007-8 financial crisis, there was a systemic change in the situation of young people in the labor market. So we were not seeing the usual frictional problems that youth have as you enter the labor market, you try different things, you may have some difficulties in the process, but there was a systemic change and that youths were having a very difficult time in accessing jobs and in accessing good condition uh, jobs, in particular in relation to their qualifications. Yeah. 
So what we have been seeing that youth employment crisis, it is a question of unemployment for those who are seeking jobs. It is a question of many falling out of the labor force in that sense that they know they will not get a job and therefore they are not looking for a job. Yeah. And also if we listen to the, the new generation expectations, they are having, they want a job also not with a sense of purpose. They want a job with a sense of engagement in social cohesion. So they are not necessarily signing into the highly competitive, polarizing labor market that we have seen developing. And then, so that is, they are opting out, waiting, those who can afford, mm -hmm. waiting for uh, better matching of jobs with skills. And we are seeing the phenomenon is really lack of quality job creation in numbers, in quantities to be able to access, to respond to those qualified, skilled, semi-skilled young people who are coming into the labor market. And the third aspect uh, of the youth employment crisis is that part of the general employment crisis is that they are having more and more spells of short-term employment, temporary mm -hmm. contracts, with no provision for long-term stability, uh, that is increasing uh, at a rate. So youth employment crisis is even more significant or more important in terms of its consequences than uh, general employment crisis. Why? Because all kinds of studies that we have done, uh, that has been done in, uh, on, the, on the topic, show that the scarring effect, the long-term effect, is very difficult. So as we saw, for instance, with COVID-19 pandemic, youth employment is very sensitive to economic downturns and crisis. And the 2007-8, the pandemic, and the pandemic also uh, affected their educational um, uh, stages and the completion of what they wanted to do. Their job search became absolutely, and the levels of employment of youth haven't gone back yet, recovered to the previous state before the pandemic. And now we are seeing another crisis. Hopefully it will not be of the magnitude and it will not impact the youth employment prospects so, so much. But let me have 30 seconds on the difficult questions, what to do. What to do. Why you, you have, have one minute and a half, don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> one, one minute, one minute and, a half. and a half. Okay, okay. that's better. So, you also have shown that they are very sensitive and this time positively responding to fiscal policy. And I really think that instead of thinking of youth policies in terms of only targeted policies, support to job search support to writing a CV, having a job interview, those are important. For a certain segment of population, uh, core skills and so on, they are all important. But the crux of the matter is creation jobs of high quality. So we should be thinking of industrial policy. We should be thinking of green jobs development, investment in digital technologies, but with a perspective of, of bridging the digital divide, especially mm -hmm. amongst the young people. So all those issues, investment in job creation, <laughs> local job creation initiatives, I really think that these should be considered youth policies, youth job creation policies. And I really also think that in terms of the governance of labor, we should be more innovative thinking out of the box for schemes and policies that are become permanent features of labor market institutions and cater especially for this difficult period of transition from school to work. Thank you. Thank you, Azita. Laszlo, uh, you come from Hungary, uh, which is a beautiful country. We love Budapest, uh, but it's the, the, most of the times that 
people in politics discuss about Hungary is about uh, the Orban uh, administration, the Orban regime. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about how and if uh, Hungary uh, actually is in a slippery road of becoming an illiberal or uh, autocratic uh, democracy. You know the Hungarian domestic politics very well. You also have the international picture in the European Union. So my question would be, uh, what is the reason, first of all, that Orban dominates uh, in, hum in Hungarian politics? How, how can he found so, so much leg legitimization uh, within uh, Hungary? And what would be the prerequisites for a political platform that could change the political course of Hungary? Okay, I, I, I thought we would come to this question. Uh, but indeed, uh, let's not uh, beat around the bush, right? So um, the European Union does have a very serious issue with the current Hungarian government, indeed because of the distortion of the democratic system, undermining the rule of law, and due to this, in the recent uh, period, the EU funds have also been suspended, right? So something which the EU was hesitant to do for a very long time, mm -hmm. now there is a possibility to play, so to speak, hardball and try to force uh, the government to correct the past. Your question is how we ended up uh, here. And we, go, we need to go back uh, a little bit in economic history to the 2009 recession, because when Mr. Orban um, achieved this two-thirds majority, this constitutional majority in parliament, it was basically a consequence of the Great Recession Hungary experienced and um, the enormous uh, uh, austerity uh, package which had to be implemented in 2009 mm -hmm. in order to keep the country afloat but at the price of a great social sacrifice affecting pensions for example but unemployment also grew poverty started to grow and everything was blamed on the previous government instead of the international financial uh, system and uh, the architecture so that's how a lot of people uh, went to support with great expectations uh, the policy of let's call it economic nationalism um, and that's where we also need to be uh, attentive not only to what happened in 2009, but what happened in the 1990s, when due to a neoliberal transition, mm -hmm. uh, the Hungarian economy and society experienced uh, some kind of dislocation. And the attempt to stabilize it on um, a social democratic basis failed after 2002, uh, mainly because of the very strong neoliberal pressure to privatize healthcare, uh, to introduce a flat tax and undermine a social democratic program. And then the offer that came from Mr. Orban was to stabilize on a nationalist ground mm -hmm. um, and, um, and enhance uh, uh, national ownership. Um, and, uh, and indeed this program gained traction. So it's not simply about distorting the political system, mm -hmm. which definitely took place after 2010, because a lot of uh, elements of the political system, elections and everything, were changed unilaterally, right? Yeah. Without consulting the public, without consulting all the political parties. But let's not uh, overlook the importance of uh, this program of um, economic nationalism, mm -hmm. which a lot of people actually like, and helps to stabilize, uh, for example, household budgets by price capping of household energy. In the previous um, uh, uh, round, uh, we didn't um, elaborate that much on the role of price capping in terms of addressing the current economic challenges. Mm -hmm. When we have high inflation everywhere in Europe, but in Hungary it's 25%. So you, know, mm. you can have a lot of problems in Europe, but the Hungarian problem is always greater. That also applies to the problem of inflation. Mm. And um, Orban is forced to go ahead with price capping much more forcefully than many other countries. Since 2013, it became a relatively popular policy um, what concerns um, uh, the household energy. Mm -hmm. But that has also been extended uh, to other products and services mm -hmm. uh, because of the runaway uh, inflation. But the runaway inflation is partly uh, the consequence of the misguided policies um, of um, uh, this government. So they somehow need to correct uh, their own mistakes in a period when the EU funds are suspended mm -hmm. due to uh, the constitutional uh, reasons. And you know, they, they, they made it harder uh, for themselves to find the right path 
and they um, uh, are losing the very important resources which would come from the European Union for essential investment. So Hungary is somehow in this trap of um, uh, the lack of uh, rule of law. Mm -hmm. the, is there the, any poss possibility for change? What do you think? <laughs> in one the, minute. The, there was one last year when we had general elections. So the next round, the next opportunity will come uh, in 2026. So hopefully by that time, a more serious alternative would be offered to the Hungarian electorate. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as it, I'm coming to you, we have only four minutes left. Uh, my question would be, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, digital, digitalization uh, of work, a lot of discussion about the future of work and the, the role of disruptive technologies in the labor process and how industrial and employment relations may change. Uh, as I understand it, there are a lot of uh, opportunities uh, through the, the digitalization. At the same time, there are a lot of dangers as well. What do you think? What's your opinion about this crucial issue? Well, in uh, four minutes or three minutes, let me say that um, the discussion on the future of work uh, just before the pandemic uh, that, that was taking place at different levels was, uh, was really focused on the technological uh, developments, this last wave of technological de developments, whether robotics are going to kill all jobs, whether um, uh, digital uh, labor platforms, as we speak, are increasing opportunities for jobs, or are they that is are the, the problem there. And we also focused a lot on um, the issue of uh, digital divide because digitalization is not progressing in a uniform way across firms. You have smaller firms that have difficulty in uh, digitalizing fully and you, the same for, for the people, for workers, for employers, and there is a gap, there is a age gap, there is a, a socioeconomic status gap, and there is a gender gap. We, we really must focus on the gender gap in, in, in the po current polarization and inequality in the labor market as we, we are seeing it. Now, to come to your question, um, let us leave uh, robotics aside. Digital platforms, as we call them, or labor platforms, there are basically two, two types those who are locally recruiting, like the transport companies, uh, food delivery, retail delivery. There was a lot of focus during the pandemic on these types of businesses that uh, um, uh, increase. It is true that they give access to some groups of the population who usually don't have access to types of jobs, but these are very low quality jobs precarious mm -hmm. jobs, insecure jobs, safety and health, uh, but low pay. But I would like to, lack of transparency in pay, lack of transparency in access or not social protection, there is a big, div a big discussion um, across the board whether, what is the employment status? Are they self-employed or they are uh, employees of the platforms? And we know that there have been many court decisions in going in the right direction and saying that they are employees in many instances, and there are movements in terms of legislation to, at the European level, actually, to tackle the issue of uh, the status of employment for this platform. But to me, uh, one important um, major challenge in its uh, all these issues, but the fact that what we are calling algorithmic management. Mm -hmm. So it is abstracting the human element. It is an algorithm that is deciding on allocating contracts, jobs, tasks. It's an algorithm that is ranking. It's an algorithm that is deciding on the acceptance of the service provided, job provided, and it's an algorithm that is rejecting the job. Mm -hmm. So this is the lack of transparency. All the institutions that have been developed in Europe and elsewhere on 
bargaining, collective bargaining, it is really undermining it. The same is true, and even I would say more um, important and more significant on those uh, online platforms, crowd work, we call them microtasking, where the employer uh, or the platform is in fact uh, recruiting across the board and across countries mm -hmm. at different time zones. And so with no uh, prospect of recourse, no organization, no uh, dealing. So we really need a, a, a major move at the national level, but also international level on uh, filling the, the governance rules across labor platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you, uh, for your participation. I, I, I hope it was interesting for the audience as well. And uh, thank you very much. That's You're all. Welcome. <laughs> thank you.